wiping the table. This is Michael, and it's season two of Flipping the Table. This is a podcast featuring honest conversations about food, farming, and the future. I do this because I'm inspired by all the people you will hear. Some of them I've known for decades, and others I've just met. But each of them are creating the knowledge, the food enterprises, farms, and ranches that will make for a future that works better for us all. Hello, this is the 75th day I've been sheltering in place and practicing social distancing to protect my family, friends, and fellow residents of Sonoma County from the coronavirus. So far, so good. We have a very low rate of infection here because the vast majority of people are loving their neighbors as themselves by following the directives of our good governor, Gavin Newsom. And it is this theme of loving your neighbor that animates today's conversation with two people quite special to me. One of them, Melita Love, I have known for 38 years. We met when she was earning her MBA at New York University, and we were neighbors in Park Slope, Brooklyn, at a time when students could afford to live there. I became her close friend, the best man at her wedding, and then godfather to her two kids, Cameron and Flannery. A native of Maryland, she has lived her adult life in the West. Today, I sit on a board of the organization that Melita founded and has built over the last 12 years. It is called Farm to Pantry, and it is dedicated to gleaning the farms and gardens of our community to feed folks who need healthy food. We'll hear much more about that in a bit. My other guest, Chef Dusky Estes, I've known for about a decade. I believe we met because of slow food. She is a Brown University educated advocate for small producers of poultry and meat, food chain workers, and healthy food access. From 2001 to 2019, when a massive flood in West Sonoma County destroyed her place, Dusky and her husband, John Stewart, operated one of my favorite restaurants in the area, Zazu Kitchen and Farm. Dusky is known nationally for her roles in the Food Network shows Next Iron Chef, Guy's Grocery Games, and Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. She has been dedicated to combating hunger for decades, having worked for Share Our Strength at the outset of her adult career. And in April, this last month, she became the executive director to Farm the Pantry. So before we begin the conversation, let me just offer the Wikipedia definition of gleaning, and I quote, Gleaning is the act of collecting leftover crops from farmers' fields after they have been commercially harvested or on fields where it is not economically profitable to harvest. It is a practice described in the Hebrew Bible that became a legally enforced entitlement of the poor in a number of Christian kingdoms. With that, let's begin. Okay, so Melita, let's begin with you. Okay. So why gleaning? What is the mission of Farm to Pantry? Well, actually, when I started this whole project, I didn't even know about gleaning. I had never even heard the concept before. And the whole idea in the beginning was to share the bounty that we had here in Sonoma County. And I realized after I had lived here not not too long that I was very lucky to be able to have access to that bounty, but that there were so many in our county that did not. And I I felt like there's something that I wanted to try to do about that in my community. And I sort of stumbled upon the concept of gleaning. And I will tell everyone here, because Michael said what good friends we are and how long we've known each other, that he was very involved in the food movement at that time, 12 years ago, like he is now. And he was one of the people I actually made an appointment uh, with your assistant to come and meet you and interview you about what I might do 
what could we do mm-hmm. as a community mm-hmm. to try to bring more healthy food to those in need? And there was all these different ideas. I was talking to lots of different people, having a farm that people would work and they would learn and about farming. And, uh, and then you told me about this concept of gleaning. And I think I've told you this subsequently. At the time, it didn't really catch hold with me. You know, I didn't have a lot of resonance. Mm-hmm. But I had it there in the back of my mind. And then one day, it's a long story, but suffice it to say, I'm always losing my uh, sunglasses. They're right here right now. And mm-hmm. I met the market manager, the farmer's market manager. And I asked, well, what happens to the produce at the end of the market? And she told me this Sad story about how the farmers just took it home and fed it to their chickens because there had been someone who collected, but that person who was a retiree had retired again, and his name was Bob. And I thought, okay, I I can just do that. And then that morphed into putting up a sign. I think my son, who Cameron, said, Mom, you got to at least have a sign or something, and telling people that I could bring their produce that they grow, if they bring it to the farmer's market, I would get it to the food pantry because the food pantry was closed and it still is closed in Healdsburg on the weekends. So if you happen to garden on Saturday or Sunday and you want to get your excess produce right away to the food pantry, it's kind of hard to do. So I put a sign out and then someone saw the sign and said she had uh, Lynn Murphy. I always like to give credit where credit is due and she had a uh, walnuts and um, so we were into October by this time and uh, what else was it? Keith? Doesn't really matter. Yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was but it was a late season harvest and she didn't want to go up on a ladder anymore and then I remembered the concept of gleaning and I thought oh my god this is what that's about and so we a couple of us went out and harvested that first crop and then she told her friend her neighbor and then we went over and did her apples and that was that that was the beginning and it really is what took off although we still go to the farmers market um, and collect at the end anything that the farmers feel that they can't sell and they would probably just feed it to their chickens so So, like that so it's been 12 years and but you're you're the mission statement is not just to glean food, it's about more than just gleaning, right? I mean, it's about community building. Well, that, I think we, we realized that when we started doing this, that this was what we were doing. We were not just making, trying to make it a healthier community for all of us, but that in the process of doing this, we were connecting with each other. And that was, that connection was creating a a greater, a different kind of connection. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so then, that's the volunteers that come and the people that own the property mm-hmm. and the people you're feeding mm-hmm. are connected through this. And we bring, as volunteers, uh, we have lots of different groups that come. So when we are in, when the schools are in session, we bring multiple school uh, classrooms cleaning with us. And maybe at the same time, we'll have our volunteers, of co- our regular volunteers, let's, let's call them regular, but they're not really regular, but... And then we have uh, two days a week, a crew that comes from our local Becoming Independent. And they are, for those who don't know, they are adults who are Developmentally disabled. Yes. And so they have a wonderful organization here in Sonoma County that gets the different uh, clients, they call them. They are their clients out into the community in ways that are best for them. So some like to volunteer and they'll come gleaning with us and some actually get part-time jobs and Mm -hmm. some of them are their in-house artists, Mm -hmm. that type of thing. So So it's community, but that's all connecting. Great. Well, that's good. That's a good framework. So um, Dusky, (laughs) so uh, a couple of questions for you. You know, you could have done a lot of things in your life. But you 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 focused on hunger alleviation and and then you ran a restaurant for years and now you've left the restaurant business <laughs> to focus on this. So I just want to hear the arc of, of how you started and then came back to this. So when I graduated from Brown 
I headed to Washington, D.C. for an internship in the public defenders. I was going to go to law school. And um, I worked in a restaurant uh, while I was at Brown, so I earned money. And I worked in a restaurant while I was in Washington, D.C. to earn money during my internship. And um, I quickly discovered that it wasn't for me to be a lawyer. That wasn't going to fill my cup. Um, It wasn't going to be what drove me every day. And I started working for an organization in Washington, D.C. called Share Our Strength while I worked in a restaurant. Uh, And it was a hunger prevention and relief organization that did traditionally fundraisers, which is how most chefs get involved in hunger work. Normally, we throw big parties for wealthy people and raise money. Mm -hmm. That's where where chefs come in to help. Mm -hmm. Uh, But so many chefs had said to SOS, we're tired of doing your party uh, all over the country. We want to actually help people. We want to feel like we're helping people. Mm -hmm. So they decided they wanted to create a direct service program, and I was the person that did that. So I created a direct service program for Share Our Strength, and they had chefs teaching a six-week class that was two hours once a week on how to shop and cook on the food stamp budget. Wow. And it was two chefs teaching about 15 people at low-income housing, at a WIC center. Uh, and Women, I, infant, children. That's where um, young mothers, uh, low-income mothers get support yeah. from the government. And I was a, a lone ranger in that work. Uh, I just, they set me loose and I I ran about and created this insane thing. And then they asked me to replicate it in 10 other cities. Wow. So we trained 10 other people to do the same. And I loved that work. And it that work landed me in Seattle when I decided I didn't want to be on the East Coast anymore. And I wanted to be closer to my family, which my mom lives in Healdsburg. Mm-hmm. So Seattle was close enough. Don't tell her that. But, uh, <laughs> but so Seattle was closer and close enough. And so I ended up in Seattle uh, working for SOS there and running also their fundraising events. Um, they had two events there at the time. And so I would organize all the chefs for the fundraising side and for the direct service side. And uh, then I met Tom Douglas, who became my next employer when I was feeling complete with the work with SOS, I decided to be the executive chef of a restaurant that Tom Douglas had in Seattle called Palace Kitchen. I worked for him for five years and met my husband there, John Stewart. Uh, We got married. We got pregnant. We decided it was time to move closer to my family than Seattle. Uh, And we decided to move to Sonoma County to be near my mother. What year was that? This was in 2000 and. 2001. We got married in 2000 and we moved here in the summer. Oh, yeah, because Zazu opened then. Yep. So we moved here and we opened Zazu and we were, because Tom Douglas uh, was my mentor, his, and he, before the term farm to table was coined, uh, he put that seed in my brain. Um, That's kind of funny that I said put the seed. I didn't mean to, but I did say put the seed. Uh, We would have meetings with farmers in the Pacific Northwest as chefs. The chefs of his restaurants would have a meeting with the farmers in the community, and Tom would pay the farmers year-round because he knew it was hard to be a farmer and live through the the down seasons. So he would pay the farmers year round so that when the growing season came, they would grow what we wanted. So we would have seed meetings and, and I loved that connection to the farmer and the product. And we got to go out to the farms and harvest. And so I always loved that. So coming to Sonoma County, obviously it was here more than anywhere. I felt like I was a kid in a playground Mm -hmm. because you could know every face that feeds you. I could know the source of my pork, my lamb, my goat, my duck, my chicken. I could know the source of every cheese that I wanted to use. I could know the source of every produce, apples, peaches, blueberries, blackberries, everything. And so um, we started Uh, making sure that we supported every local farmer because we didn't want Sonoma to become Napa. Mm -hmm. Uh, We looked at Napa as monoculture, and we saw Sonoma as diversity of agriculture. And so we were on a mission to save that amazing gift that we have here. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So, and we too became farmers. We started farming behind our restaurant uh, that was on Guerneville Road. Right. And um, then, of, as many restaurants do, we got in a fight with our landlord who pulled up our farm, and that was a you know a tearful two years, last two years there. And I looked for where to go, and we landed then at the Barlow, which was a community of makers. It was so exciting because everybody. Yeah. That's was, a that's a, uh, a development of shops and restaurants and 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 breweries and distilleries in in Sebastopol, West Sonoma County. Yeah, and cheese makers and right. uh, bread Pizza makers Pizza, and pizzas. like just ama- ama- yeah. coffee roasters. Right. Just people making and those are my people, right. you know. So we felt very lucky to be there and we were able to negotiate in the lease that the whole tw- 12 acres would be uh, landscaped, edible, forageable. So the whole property was apple trees, persimmon trees, Asian pear trees, pomegranate trees, olive trees, lemon trees, uh, strawberries. And I could run around that whole property and get everything that I wanted. It was, that part was amazing. But then the flood came and our relationship with our landlord didn't survive that predicament. Um, and so, then I, uh, my husband and I have a meat company also, as right. you know. Yes, I, I have <laughs> some of your bacon in my my uh, my refrigerator right now. I served it this weekend. Yeah, so we turn to our meat company. We make bacon and we food truck and we cater. Right. And um, then, how do you have time for farm to pantry? Well, I, when I saw this organization, I couldn't believe I hadn't even heard of it before because it's so up my alley. It's everything. Like, after the flood, I did this crazy 300-mile bike ride for right. SOS, actually, for Share Our Strength. I, that was full circle for me. Mm-hmm. They uh, have an effort called No Kid Hungry, and they have 300 chefs ride bikes to raise money for No Kid Hungry. And... They didn't have very many women chefs doing it. So they reached out to women chefs. And I have to tell you, it was a ridiculous thing for me to agree to. As you know, uh, it's all because of Tanya Holland, who right. roped me into it and then bagged out herself. And I'm always going to hold it over her head. <laughs> uh, well, she was opening a new restaurant. I know. She was a little bit busy opening actually two restaurants. Right, right. But, you know. Brown Sugar Kitchen is really great. I place, don't know so. why she couldn't find right. the time. But, uh Anyway, so I ended up doing this amazing thing with uh, Dominica from Catelli's uh-huh. and Liza from Spinster Sister. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, the three of us did it. Uh, Dominica and I came in dead last. And I am so flipping competitive, as you may have seen on any of these reality TV cooking competitions. I'm the worst sport. I don't like to lose. And uh, I was, was so proud of myself because we did it. Good. Yep. But so then when I saw this job posting, I... I feel like it was made for me and it's so exciting to be back in this realm uh more close I mean I've been in it all along but uh much more intensely fighting for food justice and food security right well you know it seems to me this is uh so you know we're going to converse so I want you both to feel free to jump in with these questions and you might have slightly different views or broadly different views doesn't matter we're having a conversation so you know I mean it is kind of amazing the timing for you because you actually applied for the job before COVID happened <laughs> and then COVID happened and the restaurant industry kind of went, went crazy crash. Yep. Um, so, and, and because you have a passion for this and there's this incredible need for it right now, um, it's actually really good timing, wouldn't you say, for the organization? I think it's like the universe spoke. <laughs> uh-huh. As a matter of fact, I don't know if I told you this, Dusky, but right when we were at the, it's just starting the shelter in place. I got concerned because we were we were in the process of starting to interview, and I said to the board, "You know, should we slow this down? Is this the right time?" And the board, to their each to their credit, each said, "No, this is the time. We have to proceed." And someone said, I um, can't remember which eloquent person it was, but that a crisis is a horrible thing to waste. To waste. Right. I guess that's been said a lot in these last several. <laughs> Right. months right now and i i agreed thankfully mm-hmm. everybody else did Thank too yeah. and um it's been speaking for as the founder someone who has wanted to see this take hold and grow and it it is in an amazing way even though right now i would say is not the time when the when the farms a lot of them are still planting they're not all year round farms but we have been 
because of a lot of Dusky's contacts, uh, farmers that you've known over the years, you have this relationship with, have stepped up out to and provide said, food. We have it. It may not be a ton, unless there are the twelve thousand lemon trees, but <laughs> but we we have it. Can you can you get a crew to come? And then we have this issue though because of the COVID, where we have can't have more than ten people. Everybody has to maintain their social distance. They're wearing masks now. Everything has to be sanitized. So we have to have smaller crews where pre this time, before this time, we would have just put the word out. We did all the time and say, the more the merrier, bring your friends. And with everybody being out of work, we could have even had more. Mm -hmm. But the way that uh, Dusky and uh, Gwen and Caitlin our, our tiny little staff have been managing it, I think has been beautiful because they've just multiplied the number of teams out there. Right. And then made sure that everyone follows the protocols that we've Yeah, adopted. step that you need to have. Yeah, exactly. So, so that, that kind of raises a question for me, Dusky. It'd be interesting to hear what you... So you've been in the f uh, hunger alleviation world for, for decades now. And we're reading all about the loss of jobs and the hunger rising. I mean, what's, what's your experience? Have you seen this much hunger this quickly develop in your career? No, I don't think any of us have. And that's what's, I mean, it has shown a bright light on how fragile the food distribution system is that we have and how messed up it is and how important it is to be local. I mean, we've always advocated for that, but in terms of meat, most of all, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would say it shines a light on we cannot be dependent on these big centralized facilities. Uh, and we need to change our regulations to allow small local farmers to survive. Um, and uh, the numbers that we see are something that I've never seen in my lifetime. I mean, I, you know, wasn't alive in the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in Sonoma County alone on the meeting that I was on last week. They gave a figure of over 52,000 people unemployed in Sonoma County. And that doesn't account for undocumented folks. Mm -hmm. And so the numbers are astonishing. It's got to be approaching 100,000 people. Um, yeah. It's, uh, there are, and so to me, when we show up somewhere and we're bringing this beautiful produce, because what they have access to in the in the general, you know, grocery bag or box situation is mostly canned and dried. Mm -hmm. And so to show up with the immunity fighting, fighting goods that they need, most of all, is I feel like I'm trying to figure out if I'm lucky to be Santa Claus or lucky to be, I feel like it's Robin Hood, except for we're not taking, we're given what we're, mm -hmm. what we're giving. Mm -hmm. um, but I just feel like I'm we coming in with my cape and I feel so lucky every day. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, also, I'd like to add yeah. a lot of the, as I uh, referred to earlier, a lot of the farms we're going to now, were, they were growing for restaurants. So Right. So they're really And impacted. they really right. have a, a number of the uh, farms have either they had CSAs, Community Supported Agriculture, or they, they, they've been able to start them. Mm -hmm. But it's been harder, I think, for those... Who, we're restaurant right, suppliers. Right. Right. But we do know, just today you were telling me that uh, Jackson Family Farm, they they are starting a CSA. Oh, good. So, well, that's the Kendall Jackson family, which is one right. of the great wine families of Sonoma County. It has a very beautiful farm that I know we glean quite often. And they've had many fundraising events for us. And and um, Taylor Tucker is on their board. Tuck, uh, Tucker, 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 Taylor, Tucker, I mean, Taylor is Tucker, on our board. And he, he yeah. uh, does a great job. He's the head farmer there. And yeah, so it's it's wonderful that um, that this is happening. I was just read, I was just looking at the New York Times today, going back to your comment about the meat meat processing. So they they have a list of all the primary places where the most people have been infected, and the worst place to be is uh, a, a home for the care of the elderly. The second is a prison, and the third is a meat processing plant. Over ten thousand workers have gotten COVID from being in a meat processing plant. So it just shows you that that concentration is is really, really tough and, and why we need to, as you suggest, have more regional food systems. So I want to talk about the idea of gleaning because um, gleaning is ancient, as, as I shared at the beginning in that Wikipedia, it goes back to the uh, ancient, you know, it's in, it's in the Old Testament. Uh, 
It's in Leviticus. It's actually. in Leviticus, right? And Ruth was one of and was Ruth, the first, right. first cleaner. First cleaner. Okay, great. <laughs> so, um, I have an opinion. I'm curious what you think. I think it's totally underappreciated gleaning, the power of gleaning, um, the 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 potential of gleaning. I'd just like to hear what you guys think about that, because I want to get into how you would scale it. But let's not get. Let's start with gleaning. Mm -hmm. Like when you invite people in. Is it the idea of gleaning that excites them? Is it being with other people? Is it going on a farm? What is motivating people to volunteer? Well, I'll, I'll address that question. So I think it really differs volunteer to volunteer. Mm -hmm. So when we first started, I told you mine was about sharing, sharing the produce and sharing the health, good health in our community. But I had volunteers say that they loved it because they hated to see food go to waste. And that was the primary thing that drove them. And then also there are, they show up because they've become friends. And we... The volunteers become friends with yes, each other. Yes, they have. And it, we've had many uh, people who have come to the community and they have just by, by chance, by, I don't know what, the chamber maybe, found out about Farm to Pantry. And it's been a, a way of connecting when they first come to uh, to the community. So I think it really speaks to each of us in a different way. But what's to me wonderful about it, um, and I've heard Dusky say this too, is it's it's a kind of it's a win-win-win. So you might be initially attracted because you may be lucky enough, we as volunteers, to have access to it, to all these healthy uh, fruits and vegetables. At least I was fortunate enough to. Um, and then, but you also know that you're you're taking the food that would go to waste, which I have subsequently learned is sometimes the healthiest food. Did you know that ugly fruit and vegetables, they work so hard to grow, which sometimes you get the carrot with the two. They've actually done studies and that's more nutritious than a carrot that hasn't had to work so hard, for example, or a tomato that is so ripe, you barely think you can pick it and get it into the box. They are the most nutritious. So that's another thing that you learn about and then you come to appreciate that. And then, as I mentioned earlier, then the connection that you make with your fellow gleaners and and your community at large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's how I would address that question. And I, my answer would obviously be that win-win that she, win-win-win-win-win-win. Like there's not a person touched by Farm to Pantry that doesn't, feel better after being touched by farm to pantry it's like for the farmer they can feel incredible that rather than something being tilled in the food is going to somebody who is hungry uh for mother earth she can know that the carbon emission is not increasing we're we're saving her for the volunteer like being outside in a beautiful place using your physical labor to help another there is, there's no greater feeling for me. I mean, I would tell you that's my highlight every day is I love physical labor and I love being outside. And having all of that go to somebody else who needs it mm -hmm. feels like, how did I get this lucky? Like, so, and it's then deeply the person, satisfying. Yeah. And the person who receives it, you know, like when we drop off at a Burbank housing unit and they have That's low income housing here. In yeah, our county, and yeah. they have not been able to afford beautiful produce like this. Like, if, I mean, it just, like, their face lights up. Mm -hmm. So, and you know that they're going to go home and have so much fun cooking it with their family. So, like, there is not, like, I can't think of a negative. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, <sighs> though, your question, though, about scaling it up mm -hmm. uh, to take it to that next level, because mm -hmm. we do rely on volunteers. It's uh, most gleaning groups, by the way, are all volunteer. And it was a decision that I, I made in, I guess, 2014 that I didn't want it. Well, they tend to then, uh, they'll be strong for four or five years and then they go away because usually it relies on the one or two volunteers who really have that passion to keep it moving forward. And so I didn't want it. I, I could see. How know, far in the pantry would fade if you didn't have some I, other I, way. Even though it. we had wonderful volunteers, I couldn't imagine anyone else stepping up and 
doing all the work that was taken just to organize one. Right. It's a lot of fun. I know now that I don't do all that organizing. I show up as a volunteer. It's a lot of fun to show up as a volunteer, even though you work hard. And on a day like today, as it must have been really it was hot. At, but, hot out there. I don't mind when the sweat drips. <laughs> right, right. But but anyway, so that's why I just thought I think we are gonna need to become our own nonprofit and find someone to to run it. And that was the course that Farm Farm to Pantry took. What year did you decide that? Uh, we became it retroactively in two thousand. We were told in fifteen. So we I probably decided it in year five, you know, two thousand thirteen that. I could see that I wouldn't have the steam to keep this going indefinitely and that I wanted to be sure that that it could at least you could institutionalize get, it. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I but scaling it up, we've we've talked about like can we create a I mean there are, it's, it's such an old concept. There's lots of gleaning models out there. We wouldn't even have to create that, but we could create how our model works and Share that, you know, like people have called it, you know, gleaning in a box or farm to pantry in a box, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Or could we scale it up in Sonoma County by having various little uh, franchises, if you will. Chapters. Chapters who we would provide the insurance. You know, once you become a 501c3, you do have to have insurance. Not So there's all, there are some costs, but it, could we become that umbrella organization that could provide that for a smaller group that just wanted to do the, they, right. just, they just wanted to do the, the gleaning part. Right. Well, the reason I asked this question is because, you know, in Europe during this time when the COVID thing struck, governments were organizing groups of people from their communities and kids in school to go and glean in Europe during COVID. So how progressive. Yeah. And, and that's <laughs> during the war that, that happened. Um, uh, both here in Europe and the United States. And so my thought is, you know, why why do we not have a gleaning core that is supported by the government that would be provide volunteers like, uh, you know, um, AmeriCorps does, that would provide groups of young people who are, let's say, on their taking their year off, what do you call that, a gap year or mm – -hmm. I mean, because right now I'm looking at all the young people I know whose schooling is all screwed up going to college. It may be delayed. They don't want to pay, you know, a bunch of money to go away to a school where it's online. A lot of people can be taking next year off. Yeah. And um, so, you know, the question is, how do we create a culture in which people reconnect to just the things that you're doing, reconnect to community and serve other people and have a good experience outdoors and learn about farming? How do we scale that? Because it seems like all the food that's been wasted because of this damn thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I did a, a podcast um, in March uh, or early April. We did it with um, a big farmer in the Central Valley who, who, who supplies restaurants and big retailers. And he told me there were 6,000 acres of lettuce around his farm that were not being harvested. Wow. Can you imagine? That is so upsetting. <laughs> and where was he? Was he in, in the, the Central, Central Valley. Valley? Yeah. I know there's a, a lot of gleaning groups out there, but somehow they didn't make that connection. Oh, yeah. These are because these are big industrial farms. Yeah. And how do you get the people out there? They're going to get them all the way to Fresno. Well, sometimes those are issues, too. There's the regulatory issues. And there's concern, I think, on the part of the yeah, there big is the, ag right. of having volunteers come right. and what happens if they get injured right. and or if a disease breaks out because of what they're but if it, they're they're if they're donating the product they probably don't have the liability but anyway these are complex issues but i'm just thinking about how how you institutionalize how you scale the inst you institutionalize you create a system for scaling mm -hmm. well and i mean i can talk smaller than that which uh -huh. is um immediately the mission when i jumped into the cyclone was to tap all of Sonoma County. So, and we have done that and are doing that. We are as far southeast as Pengrove, as far southwest as Sebastopol, and as far north as Cloverdale. Good. Um, and so we are trying to make sure yeah. that there are drops in all the communities between um, and farms in all the communities in between. In terms of scaling it even bigger. I feel like every community is so unique and Sonoma County is certainly unique. 
Like we're lucky because it works here because we have so much local food. Mm -hmm. We are the, you know, the basket for all of the Bay Area. So it's easy here that in other communities, it, there might not be as much access to, mm -hmm. to farms. Right. Like the proximity to source here is unreal. Right. So right. it's perfect for here. And is there food being wasted right now? Is there food that's not being harvested in the county? I wouldn't be surprised. But I hope not. I mean, I hope <laughs> I I mean, we have worked so hard to be out there every minute to and answer every call. But so. it, but it, when you think about the farmers, they many times are just they're working as hard as they can. So a lot of times they I've been told this, they don't even think to call farm to pantry, even though they even have a relationship with us because they are so busy and they have to plow it under to get their next crop in. Right. So just based on history, I'd say there probably is some. And then walking down the streets of our hometown and seeing all the oranges that are on the on ground, the ground. It's hard to always have the word spread and homeowners move and they the new homeowner doesn't pass on, it doesn't know or thinks well, they're going to eat all of those. Well, apples. we're sitting in my backyard right now underneath this overhang, but you can see the fig tree over there that's about, within about three weeks, those figs are going to be ready and there's going to be way more. Mm -hmm. right. You call that, me. Yeah. Call me, I'll be right here. <laughs> okay. okay. And they're beautiful. <laughs> they're, they're Kudota figs. They're really nice. Oh, they're, I've had them. You've yeah. had fig parties yes, here, right. as I recall. Yeah. Yeah. So we could have a fig and pig party. We could have a fig and pig party. That'd be <laughs> awesome. And we'll just keep our six feet apart. Yeah. Well, maybe by then we won't have to. Oh. Um, but um, so we're, we're getting close to the end here. So I just want to, I want to ask both of you, you know, based on, we, we, we kind of got into where I wanted to go, which is where do you want to see the organization that's a, a community based organization that's working with farmers, working with, folks that are quelling the hunger challenges of our community, working with low-income communities. Where do you want to see this organization in five years? Mm. Well, I just speaking for myself, I, I would like to see that it is the go-to organization in Sonoma County and that we have relationships in the other neighboring counties. And whether it's Farm to Pantry or it's their Mendocino gleaning organization that we have a relationship with. Uh, a network you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, a network, because we are part of a network of gleaning organizations already all over the state. How many do you think there are in the state? Oh, I, I, I don't know, because they come and go. Is and, it dozens or hundreds? Oh, I would say less than 100. Uh -huh. uh, but that that's again is the challenge is that they come and they go and you'll find them in all different conf looks very few of them are actually structured like farm right. to pantry that's right. why you're saying you need the structure to sustain it well that's what's been working for us right and that's why i think we could be uniquely positioned to provide not just advice and how to do it but maybe even some type of umbrella where if we could get the funding say from the state Mm -hmm. To set it up, then you could have it be more extensive throughout this air region, not just in, Son in Sonoma County. What do you think of that? Dusky? Okay, I guess I have to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all do. That's something we should pursue. Yep. I mean, uh, for me, I would, obviously, I'm only on the job about a month and a half right now. Right. I have my boots on for the last month and a half. For me, I would say a goal is these are hard times for nonprofits. Uh, right. We are all competing to survive. Um, I mean, it's hard for everybody economically, right? Non nonprofits are not left out of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, what I have seen in the short time is sometimes people forget why we do what we do. And that's the piece that I want to get everybody on the same page. So like, what, what do you mean by that? I'm not sure I understand you. Um, because all nonprofits are, are fighting to survive. Uh -huh. Sometimes they don't work well together. Uh, I got it. Yeah. And I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I want us all to remember why we do what we do and to remember to work together to help others. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
that's the piece that I'm focused on right now. Obviously, it's a it's a moment in time, mm-hmm. but it's how when we struggle, mm-hmm. we don't forget to be a good neighbor as you started. Mm-hmm. Um, that we don't forget why we're here and why we're doing what we're doing because. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've always been in for 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 being wise or being foolish. I'm not quite sure. Uh-huh. But sometimes you just have to go for it and not know where the money's going to come from. Right. And uh, I'm kind of good at that leap of faith and thinking that it'll just work out because it has to. Mm-hmm. Well, that's <laughs> what an entrepreneur is, right? <laughs> Entrepreneurs are people that don't give up. They they adapt and continue and keep an eye on the prize and and keep moving forward and adapting to the reality to make something work. I mean, you can't run a restaurant unless you're that way. Oh no. No, you can't. And you can't <laughs> you can't start a nonprofit unless you're that way. I mean, uh so you're you're both entrepreneurs. One uh you know, you have an MBA but you ended up being a social entrepreneur. It's uh, funny. I I never really thought of myself as an entrepreneur until last year the the local um Hillsburg Forever gave some awards. Yes, and, I remember you got that I award. I felt yeah. very honored, right. but I was also at the same time like uh, surprised. I thought I had not ever thought of myself that way. It was, yeah. it was an organization that was a charitable organization, a giving back organization. So it's nice to hear you say that. Yeah, no, it's nice. true. I, I think that you have to be entrepreneurial. And my hope is that people will hear this and if they don't have a gleaning organization in their community, they might start one. And they, How can they get a hold of you all to, to learn more if they want to do it? Or how can they support Farm to Pantry? Well, there's a one-stop shop. <laughs> Farmtopantry.org okay. is our website. And you can donate there. You can volunteer there. You can be a farm that wants us to come there. Um you can be a part of our Summer Supper event, which, which is, is coming up in how many weeks? June 20th June and 20th. 21st. You can buy a meal. You can buy a meal at a local restaurant. And here's another win, win, win. You fill your belly with amazing food. You support a restaurant that needs your support. And you help somebody who is hungry get vegetables on their plate. It's an amazing win, win, win. Win. Did I say enough win? Yeah, that's a lot of winning. <laughs> I'm glad you added a fourth one there. Yes, right. So you said add seven. Win, 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 win. <laughs> so I want to thank both of you for coming down on this hot day. In, uh, what is it, May 26th? It's about 95 degrees uh, in Sonoma County here in Santa Rosa. And I really appreciate you taking the time and, and sharing the good work that you're doing. And um, I wish, wish you the best of luck and uh, commit myself to help help make this fully successful. So well, thank you. You always do. Thank, thank you. you, love Michael. you, Michael. Thank and you, thank you. We appreciate it very much. Yeah. Hey, this is Michael. As you know, Flipping the Table is sponsored by Roots of Change. You can keep our program going by making a contribution to Roots of Change through our website, rootsofchange.org.